Thank you. Uh, we do this every year, or well, this is our second year. We like to uh, open up the mic to the parents and players to get an opportunity to ask the coaches any questions they want or things they're thinking about with colleges. So we're going to get right to it. Um, I want to open the mic to anybody that has a question pertaining to uh, eligibility, scouting, how to contact coaches, whatever it is, anything. Ryan Bogan has a question. One you got to handle. How do you contact? Well, the rule is we can't contact you until the last of the Going into your team, you can find Yeah, we can call you once a month. Um, and then when you're going into your season, you're August 15th, we can call you um, every once a week. Um, you guys can reach out to us as much as you want. Uh, you can call, leave a message for us. If you leave a message, we won't be able to call you back. Um, but send us an email, uh, maybe with a little short resume, maybe with some video that we can look at. Um, other than that, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's difficult for us to reach out to you. There's certain rules we can't, you know, we can't respond back. So don't think we're ignoring you, just understand that Put yourself on our radar and we'll get a chance to come see you play really well.
they make they they actually call it the eligibility center. That's what they call it. And what you do is you go online, you uh, get a username, you get a password, you pay um, a certain amount of your credit card, and what you can do is you track your status as an NCAA Division One eligible athlete. Um, what they're going to look at is they're going to look at uh, 16 core classes. Um, all the way from the start of your freshman year till four years after, to your graduation. And those 16 core classes are uh, four Englishes, three maths, two sciences, uh, an additional course from those three categories, uh, two social sciences, and then four courses from all of the above, or maybe a foreign language, or maybe a non-doctoral religion. Um, Believe it or not, there are great students that um, don't clear academically. A couple of years ago, a kid at Holy Cross, Holy Cross is a very good academic school, got in Holy Cross, had to sit on his freshman year. So this is something that you really need to look at um, as far as your eligibility for NCAA Division I. There's a minimum, it's a 2.3 uh, for GPA minimum. Um, and uh, when you're above that minimum, uh, they compare your SAT or ACT score uh, with that core GPA. Um, it's a sliding scale. The higher the GPA you get, the, uh, the higher the GPA you get, the lower SAT you be, and vice versa. Um, so something you really need to look into. You should already be, uh, if you're already in high school, you should already be just, you know, looking into it. And, uh, if you're later on in high school, you should definitely have a problem. As a player that's out of high school, how many college courses can I take? And, uh, would you guys like to, to see that out of players that graduated from high school? It, it's always great to see kids, uh, once they graduate, take classes and continue their education. You gotta be aware of, uh, you cannot be a full-time student wherever you take classes at. So it's good and uh, best to take, you know, one or two classes a semester to keep under that full-time status threshold that the NCAA has, uh, but it's always a great, uh, I know colleges like to see you take classes if you're playing junior hockey. The only thing, if you take classes, make sure you do well in them. Don't take class, just take a class. You have to do well in them, get A's and B's in them. Uh, and if you're taking class at a community college, some universities will look at them and be like, well, if you didn't do well in a community college class, how is he going to do well here? So if you take classes, make sure you do well in them. Thank you, Millie, uh, University of New Hampshire. To add to that, uh, you know, we like the idea, a lot of our players have uh, played in juniors, uh, taking courses, and they bring uh, several courses to the university, courses that they don't have to take while they're at the University of New Hampshire. Some of our players have been fortunate to uh, move on at the end of their uh, college career, whether it's the junior year, and because they brought in that many courses, they're within graduation, uh, and needing only maybe a, a a semester to graduate, even though they left school uh, a year ago, for example. So, uh, again, uh, taking the, course, the courses are important, uh, especially the, the admissions office wants to see you taking courses if you're going to be out of high school uh, for a year or two, because there's quite a few players that will uh, move on to play juniors for a year or two. So, again, uh, just add to that and make sure you do well. It's funny because I sit in a rink on a Tuesday, a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday with players and parents, and I field about 800 questions, and nobody has questions right now. So I'm going to ask another question myself. Uh, we brought it up yesterday with the 99s and 2000s. Uh, some parents don't understand the fact that the average freshman going into college hockey is 20 and a half years old. Um, so. I just want to get some feedback from the coaches explaining that to the parents and the children. 
Yeah, um, many of our, I'm Keith Elaine from Yale University. Uh, many of our, our players come in uh, a year or two after high school or prep school, they play junior hockey. And, and I, think it's, uh, I think it's beneficial for the young players on, on a couple of fronts. Uh, number one, they're much more mature when they get into college. It helps them handle the, the, the workload and, and the hockey. Uh, and also because of the fact that uh, the bulk of the freshmen in college hockey are 20 years old, if you're a 17 or 8 year old freshman, um, you're going to be behind the eight ball physically. And it's going to be a lot harder for you to compete. So uh, uh, at the end of the day, we found um, that the players that come in older uh, do better in school, they do better socially, and they do better in the hockey team. Uh, so I, I, I think it's a good thing. Hi. Um, my question is, when can we start talking to coaches, visiting schools, letting letting them know we're interested, and vice versa? Uh, Glenn Stewart from Merrimack College. I didn't introduce myself earlier, so that's that. You can start visiting schools whenever you want. Um, a lot of a lot of kids nowadays do what's called unofficial visits. Or you may reach out, have your son reach out to a coach and uh, try and set up a, you know, maybe a meet and greet. Um, but you can do that at any time. I would probably wait until sophomore year, sometime after sophomore year. Because we can't bring kids out on official visits until they're in their senior year in school, grade 12. So a lot of schools nowadays are doing unofficial visits. Um, so I think it's beneficial and, and to go visit a few schools um, at the same time. So you can kind of compare and see what you like. Okay, and if there's schools we're interested in, would it be okay to let the coaches know where we're going to be playing? We're really interested in your school, FY, here's where we're going to be playing over the next couple of months and here's my schedule. Yeah, I think that's smart because it, it gives us an opportunity that if we're at, you know, say this camp or, or you know, in the Chowder Cup or the Bean Town or whatever, it's good to know. Um, it's good to give us a heads up that, so we can, when we're there, we may, uh, you know, take a look at your son. You know, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember this, this player emailed me and kind of gets you on the radar of those schools. I just wanted to ask uh, what you think of, say, a 17-year-old going to the NA or the USHL uh, as opposed to staying local. Do you lose track of a kid like that? Um, is it better he stays here on the East Coast? Well, I think the big thing with uh, when you're looking at uh, leaving to go play the USHL or NA is did you dominate the level you were at? You know, don't just leave because it's the thing to do. And if you're going to go to the USHL and play on the fourth line or be in and out of the lineup, then I think that's definitely uh, counterproductive. Um, you know, Coach Elaine and I were talking about that today. If, if you're going to go play there and you're not going to touch the puck and you're not going to be on the power play, and you could stay here and be on the power play and not only heal it, and get a lot of ice time and develop more. And then when it's time, you know, when you dominate this level, you know, maybe it's time to move on. So, Dominate the level you're at, and you know, then then look at the next options. But I think everybody is in a rush today, you know, to get from prep school to juniors, from juniors to college, college to pros. Everybody's just in a rush to get out of where they're at. You know, I don't think that's the best way to look at it. Yeah, Jason Herder, University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, it was my first time out east uh, since I left junior hockey to come out here, and I'm glad I came because it just makes me realize that there's a ton of good hockey players on the eastern seaboard. I see all these guys west, and it's very irregular that we come east. And for me, that's going to change. But just to let you know, 
we're looking for we're looking for players everywhere. Um, our job as assistant coaches are to find the best fits for our university. Um, I think for us in Duluth, getting a young player from East would increase the dynamics within our dressing room for a different college experience for our entire group. That's why we like a few Canadians. We have a centralized group of Minnesotans. Um, couple, last couple of years we've had guys from, from Buffalo and Pennsylvania. And I, I think that it increases a student athlete's college experience. And I, I think that uh, all of you that are going to go to college, if you go on, on the East Coast, don't get some, some kids from Ontario sprinkled in and maybe the other kid from the West sprinkled in. And I, I think that will increase your all experience in college by just knowing how other people grew up. Knowing that uh, we're not just our little hockey regional bubbles, that there's good players everywhere. And for us at Duluth, we're excited to come out East to actually give our student athletes a chance to play against teams out here because of the different experience we get being a Midwestern group, our student athletes get to, to come out east and, and, and see this, the towns and the, the cities out here. Because a lot of them never been out here before. And I think that increases, it's another way we try to increase our student athlete experience.
um, similar to what Coach Otito had asked, it's related. Uh, some families have chosen for, you know, uh, for their child to go to Western Canada, BCHL or Alberta League. And I was just wondering how actively did the East Coast uh, colleges recruit, recruit there? Greg Gardner from uh, Princeton University. Check, check. Across the board, it's a, that's the hardest question to get. You know, where should my son play? And especially local, there's so many options. You've got to feel very comfortable with the coach and the situation you're at. Am I going to develop here or should I go somewhere else? Once you're through high school and you've already played the junior level in your own town, it's a phenomenal opportunity to maybe go do a gap here somewhere else. But personally, I, I've, I've been out in the, the new US PHL, those, uh, those rinks. I've been to prep schools. I've been all the way up to uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, North American League. If you have academics and you're a good hockey player, you know, I'll be in your rink. So if it's a matter of you know, developing and, and just trying to be a better hockey player, there's, each league is different. It doesn't mean it's better to go away. That being said, I will be in British Columbia watching your watching you guys play. I will be in uh, you know global rinks here watching you play. You've got to you've got to show up and, and be the best player on the ice, and you've got to show up and be one of the best players in the league for us, for any of us coaches, to take notice. So it has a uh, you know it's nice to have that that tag of the league and the, and the team you're on. But at the end of the day, you've got to. You gotta put the effort up and, and be one of the top players in the league, whatever league you're in, to get noticed. Guys, can you address the uh, the role or the necessity of a family advisor and, and how much you lean on an advisor to identify kids for you?
They say um, you can get better to 28 years old. After that, page two feet. So after 28, what you got is what you have. So uh, no, family advisors, they're great. But if you uh, have one, use it the right way because uh, there's a lot of kids out there that get a family advisor and they kind of peek out. You know, you have great coaches. You know, a lot of you guys play for guys like Benny Smith that I know real well, Mark. Those guys can make a phone call to us just as good as a family life. Hey, I'm Kyle Wallen from the University of Vermont. We touched on it a little bit yesterday with uh, the younger guys. and uh, I go back and forth on the family advisor thing. And sometimes they get in the way. Sometimes there's guys that are good guys in a bad business. And sometimes there's guys that are there to steal your money. So, uh, do your homework on them and, and know that they're there for you in the process and if you decide to choose one. Um, do your homework on them. Know their background. Know their network. Know what players they have. We got 150 guys in there. 150 guys on their client list, well, you're probably not going to be a president to them. So uh, ask the right questions. You have a family plan. Know what it's going to cost you. Some guys are charging you the loose. Some guys are charging minimal. So there, there is a certain expense you have to pay under the NCAA rules. Just uh, do your homework and know they're there for you. They're there for you. You're not there for them. My, my question to you guys, um, I got the concept about the NCAA clearing, um, the higher your GPA, your, your SAT scores don't have to be as high, it's still clear, but what happens if a kid has a 3.8 and his uh, SAT score is only like a 1600? Uh, I was under the impression that some schools, you wouldn't be able to get in with a 1600 or under a certain, like say 1800 score to get in, is that true? Uh, yes, it is true. Um, you know, and, and every school has their own admissions department, their own admissions criteria. The NCAA Clearinghouse really has nothing to do with admissions to a college. What the NCAA Clearinghouse is, it, it tells you whether you're going to be eligible to compete at the Division One level um, if you clear. So, uh, um, so those are two different things entirely. But uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of schools, 1600 SATs aren't going to get it done. Just to build on the, uh, the application process, would, if a player is going to take off a year before going into college, would they look to apply to the schools that they are targeting or, and defer after acceptance, or would, would, um, would the application process start a year following? Scott McDougall, Sacred Heart. Um, you can do either way. You can you can apply early and defer. Um, one thing for schools to take SATs during your year off, you can take your test scores up and improve them. Um, once you finish your high school career, you only can change one class in your transcripts. You can't really change your grades too much, but you can upgrade your SATs or ACT, whichever one you take. So really, either way, you can do it. You can apply for that year and then defer. Um, but for the most part, we have our guys just apply for the year they're coming in. Just speaking, uh, Mark White Brown University, speaking on behalf of the Ivies and probably some of the stronger um, Division three schools, I think. you want to be careful if you're going to apply right out of high school. Uh, <clears throat> if you apply to Brown and you don't get in, and then uh, we eventually see you down the road uh, after playing junior hockey for a year. Uh, we probably won't be able to get you in that year. Um, so it'd be smart to not apply uh, unless you are an exceptionally strong student. Uh, as with most of the Ivies here, your admissions slot is supported by the hockey program. Um, so that does, does give a little bit of flexibility with admissions. But I'd be very careful to apply to schools that you are uh, extremely interested in especially if you get denied, because um, then you'll be off the board for us.
if we'd like you as a hockey player. With the meet and greet, um, the players, are there, if they are allowed to contact you and set that up, or how can you set up those meet and greet? Keith Fisher, Penn State. Uh, players are allowed to contact us at any time by phone, email, uh, text, whatever. We're unable to respond to it though. Uh, so we encourage kids to call us as many times as they can, leave messages, uh, call back as many times until you get a hold of us. You know, sometimes we're working showcases like this, we don't have a phone, we're on the ice, uh, traveling, whatever. You're not a bother to call back. All right, your kids that we want to talk to, please call back as many times until you get a hold of us. That's our only means of communication right now. Um, you can email us, we can't email you back. You can text us, we can't text you back. So you can contact us at any time, and then once we do get established some communication, then we can set up you know, an unofficial visit you know, when we're in town and what works good with your schedule as well. Just refrain from contacting them tonight. They need a good sleep after a long day, so don't all go home and call them tonight. Yeah, I know we touched on this last night, but I think the older guys and the parents here, um, and I know it's a tough question for some guys, um, the social media stuff. Um, just wanted to go, how much do you guys honor that? How important is that for these guys to, especially the guys who are committed, um, and the guys who are uncommitted or potential to play D1, uh, how important is the social media aspect as far as uh, keeping it clean? Mark Phelan, Northeastern University. Um, we did touch on that last night. It's a uh, really important subject for us because, you know, as, as staff members at all these schools, we, I'm, guarantee you most of these guys follow all the players on Twitter you know I don't know about Facebook too much uh, if, if you're really friends with your players on Facebook but Twitter especially because it's so public and all I'd have to do is Google one of your names out there and uh, I can probably find you and your tweets and the things you're saying what's on your mind uh, photos you're putting up and everything so once it's out there it's out there and you never want to compromise your uh, your integrity as a person on, on Twitter. Um, sort of <laughs> um, also, uh, where was I going here? Um, we have a rule at Northeastern that we talk to our players about saying that uh, don't put anything out there that you wouldn't want your mother or your grandmother to read. It's a pretty good uh, rule of thumb to go by. Just don't embarrass yourself, don't embarrass your family. She lost her voice caring for her son. So, her question was Could you explain verbal commitments? A verbal commitment is when a, a player commits to a hockey school and a hockey school commits to a player saying, Son wants to come to hockey school A, and hockey school A wants to come, uh, want you to come to our school. You know, for scholarship schools, you know, there's an agreed upon, agreed, um, agreed amount that's a, per year. That could be you know, staggering up, it could be straight across. For Ivy League schools, we don't have a national letter of intent for uh, we're all um, verbal commitments. And, uh, there's two kinds of verbal commitments, the ones that start really, really young and you kind of have to babysit them along the way and make sure everything is um, working together to get you to come to uh, the university, and the older verbal commitments, which are usually during the gap year. The gap year when you finish high school, you're going to play that year between uh, you know, you're graduating high school and coming to college.
Russell Duluth be our, our scholarship school. And it, it gets tricky sometimes. We, we have, I call it a salary cap. We have an 18 scholarship salary cap. And we carry mostly probably 26 players. Uh, some schools do it different, the scholarship schools. So try to get an 18 full ride in front of five or six paid players. Um, we at Duluth, we try to make sure everyone has some sort of academic money. Um, on the other side, when you, when you do do a verbal commitment and, it, and you, you, it becomes a dollar value to it, it gets tricky when, when you can't have that money spent the year the kids coming to school. You can't overspend. Uh, some schools do, some schools have people leave early and they get lucky that way. Uh, we haven't been in a situation, but I know some schools have been in a situation where they have to defer kids back because players didn't leave or overcommitted. Um, so it gets pretty dicey when it comes down to verbal commitments uh, with the scholarship schools. Um, that being said, when we're putting a dollar value to it and uh, we can't spend that money, it, it's a huge commitment on our part as well. It's not just words, it's not just let's see how things go. Um, when we mention babysitting the kids, we really should try and babysit because you don't spend that money for three years, you get player A, you don't get player B, C, or D. Two years later, that money spent that player decommits from you, you just lost out on the four best other, you have four other players that you liked from that age group. So you're gonna start all over again. So that's the, the problem, in my opinion, with early commitments and, and stuff like that. It's, it's rolling the dice, but uh, obviously we do it. No further questions? All right, I want to thank all the coaches that uh, answered all the questions. I learned a lot from this year to last year, so I want to thank you guys. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and best of luck the rest of the way out with our showcase. Thanks.